wild Hunting, fishing is my kind of style I pluck the wine new chew when it gets hot I'm proud of all the things that I've got I'm digging in my specs up in the sand And after work a cold beer in my hand Picking wild berries off God's land I'm drinking my buddy's homemade wine Living Northwest wild Hunting, fishing is my kind of style I pluck the wine new chew when it gets hot I'm proud of all the things that I've got I'm digging in my up in the sand And after work A cold beer in my hand Picking wild berries Off God's land And drinking my buddy's Homemade wine In the Northwest Wild Hey everybody, good evening and welcome to Fish Hunt Northwest. Dwayne England live here in studio this evening. Well, Kind of. Okay, I, uh, I don't have a crew. With everything going on, uh, Josh and David are home, Barnum is home. You know, we're in some trying times right now, so we're doing the best we can to bring you some uh, content that hopefully uh, you can sit back, unplug, and enjoy for the next couple hours. Uh, I'm going to be doing the show by myself this evening, uh, so some of this is a mixture of uh, current relevant information, of course, a few segments built in that are pre-recorded and brought back for your viewing pleasure. A lot of you who have joined us over the last several months may not have even seen some of these segments I'm going to interject in tonight's show. So with that, uh, this is truly a pre-record, only the second time I've had to do this based on circumstances. And hopefully everybody within your circle is currently safe uh, and free from uh, COVID-19 um, and as we move through the future, however long that may be, or hopefully near short future, uh, I just wish that uh, and hope that everybody stays, uh, stays abreast of what's going on and uh, how truly serious this is. You know, I, I unfortunately have to deal with this at work on a daily basis and um, getting ready to work a 72 hour shift through the weekend. And, you know, as it increases day in and day out, uh, we are really subjected to the unknown and where this is going to go. So I'm just asking people to be advocates of, you know, truly what we need to do to stay safe, uh, recognize our, uh, you know, recommended distancing practices, washing hands, all those things. And you guys are hearing this from everybody else. And I'm going to, you know, spend the whole evening talking about this, but it kind of hits home when you deal with it uh, in your face day in and day out in the workplace. Um, for some of you who are going to be told to stay home, perhaps, you know, we have other things we can do. We can get outside, we can get away from people, and we can enjoy, especially with this amazing weather that we have going on. So for tonight, let's just, uh, let's just get through a couple hours of great content. I have some additional interviews that I'm going to plug in here as the show progresses. Going to go back and revisit uh, segment one with Julia Smith, WDFW Wolf Coordinator. That that one gained a lot of traction. She has a lot of really relevant information that's still pertinent to uh, where we're going in the direction of wolf management. And also I'm gonna replay a segment with Chase Gunnell, Communications Director with Conservation Northwest. He was on recently, and if you missed that episode, some really good content from him in regards to a lot of things going on uh, with their agency, some of the uh, up and coming events that led to uh, WDFW securing their budget and just some other um, you know, conservation things going on throughout the Northwest that uh, Chase is on top of. So those are two really good segments. But on top of that, I wanna bring you some, some relevant news information as we always open the show with what's going on around the Pacific Northwest and beyond. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, we are also going to bring you a new uh, cooking segment, recipe of the week with Chef Kelly and Sherry in the kitchen, a coho salmon, uh, over cabbage and potatoes in, a, in an apple wine, white wine sauce, something like that. Anyway, fantastic recipe. I believe in the show somewhere in a preloaded segment, I'll allude to a different recipe. <laughs> Just disregard that. It truly is a fresh and new relevant recipe that Chef Kelly and Sherry kicked out last week. So you want to stay tuned for that one. It's a good one. Um, and I'm going to do a couple segments in the bait lab. One, we are going to cure some 
oversized, large steelhead eggs. We got out on the river the other day, my son Jordan, the beard, uh, jingling jigs, uh, knocked a beautiful 15, 16 pound hatchery this late, mid-March, yep, they're still around, big hatchery hen. When that fish came out of the water, you would have thought, absolutely, it must be a wild fish, but lo and behold, a hatchery fish, just a dandy. Um, you can see that picture of that fish up on our Facebook page if you haven't already. Anyhow, the eggs out of that fish are well worth the value in. I'm going to go through a process of curing those up actually for springers and or I can use them later in the season fall fishing if I don't have opportunity to chase springers in our tributaries, okay? So very isolated in where we can go in that regard. There are a few opportunities coming up, you know, through May and June is when I focus on tributary springers or could even happen within the next month of April. Uh, we'll just kind of see how things go. But that being said, I wanted to cure those up, give you guys some ideas on how to really dial in some of your egg cures and some natural additives we can put into them. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some extra things I do to really make your eggs uh, extremely appetizing for a finicky fish like a springer and how well they will also work for your fall salmon, both coho and chinook actually. So um, stay tuned for that. And I'm also gonna replay because I've had a lot of requests for the way I demonstrated a few months ago on how I was filleting out a nice uh, Chinook salmon or as a coho, can't remember. Anyway, um, anyway, the, the way I go about filleting out my larger fish now to actually remove a strip of the pin bones out of there and leave you with 98% fillets out of salmon, steelhead, whatever species of fish, even some of the larger kokanee and triploids that I get, uh, I will fillet out this way to remove those pin bones. And it gives you, you know, like I was saying, 98% fleshy, meaty, great tasting uh, fish without the nuisance of bones. Okay, so that's kind of the goal. So, got a lot of information we're going to cover. Got a couple of great segments we're going to replay. Going to show you a couple of different tips and techniques in the bait lab. Really just kind of coupling together a great show. It is our one year anniversary. We started this show last March. March 21st was our first show here in the Fish Hunt Northwest uh, studio. Today is March 19th. It is literally our one year anniversary bringing you a show, albeit not completely live, but stick with me through the show. I'm going to be online this evening, uh, chatting it up with you folks as you follow the show along and have questions. Would love to be able to do that. You know, sometimes when we're actually doing the show, I don't have a lot of time to uh, interact and answer questions as you fire them off. So more than willing to sit there for a couple hours tonight, make that happen as the show plays through. So just be aware, our typical format is completely a live show, uh, albeit the cooking segments, as you guys have figured out to this point, pretty much are always a pre-record, so we can bring you quality presentation and not be jumping around. Uh, with that, the show is typically live every Thursday. Now, if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, thank you, and make sure you follow us on our Facebook page. Um, you know, click the like, hit follow, I would like and encourage all of you tuning in this evening, you know what, take a second, jump over to our YouTube channel. Find us, Fish Hunt Northwest, on YouTube. Click the subscribe button, please. Help us build our YouTube channel so you never miss a segment or an episode. Uh, do that for us and help us build that page as it is continuing to build, as well as our overall show. We have 73, 7,500 followers now on Facebook in our first year, pretty happy about that. Want to build that to 15,000 by next year. Um, doing a great job each and every week with a lot of you tuning in. We couldn't be happier here at Fish Out Northwest with the uh, you know, first season that we've had. So year one after tonight is in the books. Next week, fully intend on bringing you a live show format as we do each and every Thursday. Uh, I may or may not have Barnum back. He is, uh, you know, he's a contractor, he runs his own business. Things are a little uh, dicey right now for all you guys out there working and having to run your own business. Don't know where this is going to go. It builds each and every day. And you know, rule number one for all of you, for, for me and for my guys here at Fish on Northwest, is family first, okay? Family first. Take care of your business. Take care of your family. Stay safe and uh, do what is asked of you in the private sector to help this thing pass on through. So we're not dealing with this thing all the way into July and August. So um, with that, I want to remind everybody that Fish Hunt Northwest is presented by, each and every week, 
uh, Better Homes and Gardens Pacific Commons Real Estate located in Puyallup, Washington. And of course, our very good friends out at Defiance Marine in Bremerton, where they build the lines of Arima, Allied, and of course, Defiance Boats. Check them out at defiance.com and uh, they will have a boat for you guaranteed. With that, Let's jump into a few things going on around the Pacific Northwest and beyond. And actually, looking at the weather this weekend, you have a golden opportunity. You want to talk about uh, distancing yourselves from other folks. Well, to a point, got some clam digs that are going to happen. And uh, they start Friday. Tomorrow evening, uh, you have a minus tide. And you know the nice thing about the, the spring forward daylight savings times? We're actually digging clams in daylight hours now, which is fantastic. So Friday night's tide is a uh, minus tide at 5.27 p.m., which is still plenty of daylight. Get out there a couple hours before, start fishing, or fishing, start clamming on that outgo minus tide, and you're gonna have great result. The clam digging has been fantastic. You have Long Beach, Twin Harbors, and Mocrox. Uh, you can go to WDFW, look under news announcements or clam digs, team clam gun, team clam shovel, and you know what, take your pictures, post them up to WDFW, let them know which team you are on. I'm a clam gunner, uh, just because it makes it that much easier. Went out, you know, as you guys know, a couple weeks ago, got our limits daily. Um, really good opportunity. The weather's gonna be fantastic. 55 to 60 degrees on the coast. Very little wind. I mean, as much little wind as there is on the coast when you're out digging clams. Let's, uh, let's be respectful of other people's space, you know, stay in arm length, and like I say, you know, hey, excuse me, sir, ma'am, uh, distance of a clam gun away, please, and uh, we'll work our area, you work yours, plenty of clams for everybody, and you know, you get out there early enough, you're digging daylight hours, you probably have your limit within an hour at the most, if you know how to spot them in the sand, and we have Friday through Monday, and uh, Monday we got some weather coming in, so it might compromise it a little bit. Looks like about a 98% chance of rain. But prior to that, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, very little chance of rain. Weather looks fantastic. The clam festivals, I got to remind you folks, clam festivals at Ocean Shores and Long Beach, uh, I don't want to say canceled, they've been postponed possibly for a couple months depending on how this COVID-19 thing goes. So along with all other type of large gathering community events, the clam festivals have been postponed as well. You can re, uh, find all that information on the WDFW website. Uh, click on that link, go to the news feed. All of that stuff is piled on there daily, weekly, whenever it's relevant that they upload fresh content and information. So get out and dig some clams. Get, out, get outside, go uh, do some surf perch fishing, get your clams, go steelhead fishing. We got blackmouth fishing, we have bottom fishing, lingcod. Go out to the coast, get on the jetties, chase after your link on your bottom fish. There is plenty to do that can distance yourselves from other people. Get outside in that fresh air and do yourself a favor, okay? This is a great time to take the kids out, teach them ever skill, uh, extra skill sets that you can't necessarily always find time to do because you're you know, in the home, busy with work, they're in school. This is family time. This is a great opportunity to have parental and child interaction on a level you guys maybe haven't seen in a long time. So, you know what, let's make the best of this, take full advantage and uh, enjoy. With that, last week I did mention I was gonna, going to kind of run down some of the wins in the win column, I guess, for WDFW budget. Remember last week we announced and it had come out that WDFW in fact landed 27 million in their uh, budget submission. So they're asking for 26, they landed on 27. And there's some takeaways from here that are actually pretty encouraging. Um, this actually gives them uh, funding through June of 2021, okay? So we have that uh, locked up for sure and they're gonna do some pretty good stuff with the money they have. Uh, one of the disappointments, and I mentioned it last week, was that they were able to push on through uh, a proviso in, introduced by Kevin Van De Wedge, a uh, Democrat out of Squim. And this one is the verbiage that, that creates the nine-person panel uh, from the Academy of Science, who will now be reviewing the fisheries submitted by WDFW and the co-managers uh, prior to NOAA. So there's another cog in the wheel. There's another you know, step in this process of bureaucracy in 
<clears throat> creating our fisheries, do they fall within ESA listings and fall within conservation restrictions? And uh, can we perform these fisheries? So now we have, which will be formed a nine person panel. Three of those folks come from the Academy of Science who vet the additional six persons that will be on this panel. I'm, Barnum and I are very curious as to where this is gonna go. Uh, not happy about it. Um, if that was one of the catalysts to, hey, we gotta have this in here to push this budget through, you know, the politic and behind doors, you never know what's going on. But bottom line is, this has been slipped in there. We'll kind of see how this materializes. And uh, if it continues to cut back on our opportunity, there's gonna be uh, a lot of uh, very upset people. So can't exactly say where it's gonna land, but it is recognized that it'll be formed and we'll just have to, have to wait it out and see what it does. We did uh, end up on the capital budget side, another 4.6 million was allocated for restoring the Seuss Creek hatchery on the Duwamish slash Green River. So that's a good thing they produce, uh, millions of Chinook and Coho out of there. And uh, to support the ORCA program, we have now those additional Chinook that'll be coming out of that facility once it's revamped and rebuilt. So good things to come there. Uh, Director Seusswin also credited unprecedented support. And I'm gonna read a little bit of this off here. Puget Sound Anglers plus 60 plus sporting conservation and other organizations as well. As uh, you know, like PSA, help from the American Sports Fishing Association as well as Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. A lot of folks came to rally in support of WDFW getting and obtaining their budget this year. A lot of uh, the recreational groups and those that are involved in fisheries management we're urging legislators to go ahead and pass this budget on through. Give WDFW the funding they need to continue to move forward with programs and stop this nonsense with lack of funding and tremendous cutbacks all the time. We need to get past that. We need to find means of permanent funding structure. We need legislation to come back to the table next year, more willfully pulling money out of the general fund uh, coffers and giving them a percentage annually that they don't have to go back year in and year out and beg for. So that would be down the road, hopefully. Uh, Mitch Friedman, Conservation Northwest, has been working diligently as well the last couple of years, really trying to focus on, you know, that political insight of talking to those politicians that can make the difference, make change come about. So we need to support those groups and those folks and advocate strongly that WDFW continues to receive funding. And let's push that to a higher level. Let's see if we can't get WDFW to obtain 1% of the general fund moving forward. The amount of money that would land in WDFW for simply 1% of the general fund annually would build their budget tremendously. And uh, I think we would see a, a definite change in the way our fisheries are managed, our opportunities are managed, and both fishing and hunting. So uh, things to think about. Um, there is also breakdowns uh, as they look at it for permanent funding that was introduced. They do have some items, line items, that they don't have to go back each and every year now and chase after. And they have other uh, measures provided for one-time one -time funding. So some of the programs that are ongoing and secured funding for, you know, we have 861000 annually for Puget Sound salmon monitoring required because of all the ESA listed stocks. So just uh, shy of a million, a million dollars, but that monitoring is crucial for a lot of our ESA stocks and to ensure that we're conducting fisheries that don't hamper the recovery of those ESA stocks of uh, Chinook. 517,000 for post fire habitat recovery. Uh, a lot of folks forget that we were subjected to a lot of habitat loss due to the wildfires over the last few years, uh, followed by a couple of very hard winters for, with winter kill. Those in combination were like the perfect storm which dropped some of our mule deer and whitetail numbers in the toilet, literally, uh, and we're trying to rebuild from that. So uh, just over half a million dollars for post-fire habitat recovery is vitally important. 400,000 annually starting next year to set up a, a uh, hold station for inspecting vehicles and vessels for invasive species as well as boater outreach. Another important uh, component, you may not think so, but Invasive species in our uh, surface water areas, lakes and reservoirs could be extremely detrimental to some of our uh, fisheries. They also provided um, funding to match fe uh, federal funding, $225,000 uh, in the South Sound for orca protection. That's a, that's a huge bump. 
Um, now looking at some of the one-time fundings that were uh, put through the budget this year. 573,000 next year for reverse auction of gill netting licenses for the Columbia River commercial salmon fishery. We'll see how that goes. Buyback program they're trying to introduce. We have over a half a million dollars slated for that uh, uh, program to be pushed through. No idea where that's gonna land, but uh, one to keep eyes on. We have 500,000 to begin planning to boost the hatchery Chinook production uh, for the new hatchery on the Cowlitz River. So a half a million dollars to increase hatchery Chinook production back on the Cowlitz River. That should be pretty exciting news. Just under a half a million is slated uh, for 2021 for removing sea lions in the Columbia River when the National Marine Fishery Science grants the joint state and tribe permits to do so. So there's another good chunk of change as we continue to combat our pinniped overpopulation issues, especially as it relates to the Columbia River. I wanna see a lot more monies coming forward in both regards to Columbia River. A lot of our tributaries that drain into Puget Sound and of course throughout Puget Sound in the Salish Sea, dealing with pinnipeds of all different uh, species grades. So we're talking California Stellars, Harbor and Gray Seals, they all have an impact at different times of the year and we need to be on top of all those. 357,000 next year to continue removing invasive species, Northern Pike. You remember earlier on in the year, we talked with our buddy Chris Donnelly, fish program manager region one over on the east side. The pike issue in Lake Roosevelt is becoming critical uh, to this level. They need the funds to continue monitoring that and working with the tribes to eradicate the pike out of Lake Roosevelt before they find their way down into the main stem Columbia then it's uh, all bets are off. No idea where that would land if they're able to find their way into that. So we have a lot of uh, really positive things going on uh, relative to budget with WDFW and where they landed. Pretty happy that they were able to secure that 27 million. And it looks like they have a lot of uh, work ahead of them over the next couple of years. Um, and as we get into mid 2021, they'll be back at the table negotiating with lawmakers once again. And I, you know, I just advocate for us, we have a year to do our due diligence, support those recreational uh, groups, organized groups, and support those that are supporting increasing funding for WDFW, get involved. That needs to be the message carried forward. Let's secure some permanent funding for WDFW. All right, I uh, wanna remind everybody, hey, with all this stuff going on, we still are putting forward, moving forward our plan to have folks join us over at Lake Roosevelt. Uh, in June, first week of June, June 4, 5, and 6, arrive on the 4th or 5th, stay two or three nights. We're going to have seminars by the Max Lure Pro staff. We're going to teach you how to fish Lake Roosevelt for kokanee, triploids, and walleye. We're going to teach you how to fish Banks Lake for walleye. It's all right there. We're staying in Electric City on Banks Lake at the Sky Deck Motel, okay? Rooms are typically that time of year, 135 a night. We have you hotel rooms slated for $85 per night. And or we're staying over at Cooley uh, Playland Campground and any camping spot, whether it's a tent site or an RV with hookups right along the water's edge, $30 per night is all they're asking. So we're trying to bring together a large group. The information is on our Facebook page. It's pinned to the top, the contact information, uh, phone numbers, uh, also links that you can click on, check out their Facebook pages uh, or their website, whatever I put on there. Um, we have time to build this, but they have about 30 to 35 rooms at the Sky Deck. If you're towing a boat over, you're gonna stay at the Sky Deck for a couple nights. You wanna get your reservations early before they absolutely run out of rooms, because I guarantee as we get closer, I mean, we got folks down in Oregon that are coming up. We got folks coming over from Idaho. It's gonna be a fairly large event with lots of participants, which is exactly what we need to do. It'll be that first weekend of June. Uh, you know, kids are probably out of school through the year is what we're hearing. So families are gonna need things to go and do. By that time, let's hope that this COVID-19 is laying low. We can reconvene and get groups together. Uh, you know what? If we have to all show up and sit in the seminar six feet apart, we're gonna do so. We're gonna monitor our spacing and we're gonna enjoy our time in the outdoors chasing fish, keep your boat clean, keep your area clean, and uh, you know, let's get out, learn how to fish new fisheries to you if you've never been over there, and uh, the Max Pros are gonna help us do that. Really good event, gonna have 
a good amount of giveaways, free raffle for showing up. You just have to pay your way over there, pay for your room and board, bring your own food, and uh, we'll handle the rest. We'll teach you how to fish those particular bodies of water. We'll get out on the water and help each other out and look forward to some really nice weather, some very quality fish. Lake Roosevelt's fishing very well this year, so great opportunity by then to get into some of those two to four, maybe five pound kokanee. If you've never caught one of those, you're missing out. Not to mention the triploid fishery uh, is fantastic. They cut as red as a sockeye and they're delicious. And we'll get you onto those walleye if you've never caught walleye. So it's a trifecta that you need to be involved with. And it's not going to break the bank for you to get over there and come join us. So June 4, 5, and 6, get on our Facebook page. Check out the information. Make your reservation and be sure to join us. All right, with that, we are going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. We're going to revisit a segment we did uh, earlier in the season, earlier in the year, uh, actually just a few months back with uh, Chase Gunnell, Communications Director of Conservation Northwest. Some really insightful information. And as we walk our way through the show, we're going to cover a number of things. We'll, we'll spend a little time with Julia Smith uh, talking wolves again. Great segment if you haven't seen that. Again, we'll have a recipe of the week. We've got two things for you to put your eyes on and listen to and learn out of the bait lab this evening. We'll be curing some eggs, fresh content that's relevant. You want to pay attention. And we'll show you an interesting way how to fillet out larger fish that you'll want to be using throughout the rest of the season. Uh, we'll come back after all that and wrap this up. So stay tuned through the commercial break. We'll be back right here on FHN. Defiance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, Defiance Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase? If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals. So we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes, and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone, or in store, and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed. Quality service from real people who know metal. We are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives, fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal. Visit or call a Metal Supermarket store near you today. What if there was a smarter way to search for your new home? Introducing the Better Homes and Gardens real estate website and mobile app. This revolutionary new search tool puts your needs first. Narrow your search to what matters most to your family 
like school data, school districts, and even walk scores. Get easy access to your local affiliated agent, as well as unique and local insights about neighborhoods and properties directly within the app. With sync and safe preferences, you'll always pick up wherever you left off. Get your smarter search started today with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Welcome back, Fish Hunt Northwest. In studio, Dwayne England, Kelly Barnum, and of course, Chase Gunnell. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, nice to have you back. Second time in studio. That's right. Yeah, how yeah. you been? Good. It's a good hunting season. Decent fishing season. Yeah. Busy now with the legislative session. Oh, I appreciate a chance to check in with you guys. Yeah, man. You're doing good things. I, uh, you know, we actually kind of, you know, mix it up a little bit on Facebook from time to time, kind of keep track of what you guys got going on at Conservation yeah, we like Northwest. To argue with you. Huh? <laughs> Well, we wouldn't be Northwest hunters and fishermen if we didn't like to argue, right? Yeah. True. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good point. So, uh, yeah, you got out even uh, got a few blackmouth as of late. Yeah. January was pretty good. It mm -hmm. seems to have tapered off a little bit yeah. though. At yeah. least for me. Yeah. Well, I actually I think for a number of folks. So we're going to talk about that a little bit too later on. But uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of been hit and miss. And you know, biggest overwhelming thing I'm hearing from a lot of guys. I haven't even had time to get out there yet. But uh, uh, just lack of bait. Yeah. It's not a lot of bait around. I was out on Sunday, and that was exactly our mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not well, a lot of feed. It is what it is. So um, last week, or the week before, one of those times, Barnum and I kind of dove into the uh, Cooks Agriculture uh, Pacific, the uh, transition from uh, raising Atlantic salmon in these net pins up here in Puget Sound to the triploid rainbow, which they want to call steelhead, which, you know, I actually, uh, Sherry and I were in Costco yesterday, and it says... Uh, right there underneath the cellophane wrap, it says steelhead. And I'm looking at these fillets going, that is so much of a triploid I'm looking at with the amount of fat in that creature right now. There is no winner in steelhead that has that amount of fat, you know, in it. It's just, it's a sales thing to the yeah. community and mm -hmm. it's, it's not steelheads, triploid rainbows, let's call it what it is. Um, but uh, we, we had had the conversation and raised a few concerns just from a lay perspective that, you know, it's an unnatural biomass in an area. They're they're introducing these fish and the amount of feed they put into the water and just the whole the whole thing. Um, what what is your spin on it? What's what's someone or an, uh, an organization like Conservation Northwest? How do you guys look at this and say, oh, we're we're no longer raising Atlantic salmon, so it's a win? Yeah, let me just be clear really quick though. So so my day job is with Conservation Northwest. Yeah. I'm the communications director there. I've been there about six years. I'm also a board member of the Wild Steelhead Coalition. Correct. I've been involved with that group for almost a decade now. It's a great grassroots outfit that does steelhead conservation, works with local anglers and guides. I really appreciate you guys digging into that last week. And um, while Conservation Northwest has been involved to some extent in the fish farm issue, we uh, signed on to some of the letters and, and supported the legislation in 2018. Uh, we tend to stick to some more of the terrestrial issues, you know, fish, uh, wildlife, Makes sense. habitat. But that doesn't mean we're not tracking this, and it's sure. something that I've been involved in through the Wild Steelhead Coalition. Mm -hmm. But just want to make sure that my hats are clear. Yeah. I've got my WSC hat on right yeah, now. Yeah, you do. Wear both <laughs> so hats, in that actually. vein, you know, we, yeah. we have been tracking this fish farm proposal really closely. And um, you know, I'm not a fishery scientist. I would encourage you, if you guys are interested, to to get in touch with someone who knows the science around fish farms a bit deeper. But having been involved with the policy around these, right. we were very disappointed by that news. We, we worked very closely with the Department of Fish and Wildlife on a number of issues. I spoke directly with the director on this topic. I yeah. appreciated that he was willing to give me a call about it. I spoke with the director of the fish program, Kelly right. Cunningham. Right. We understand that they're in a tough situation as far as regulatory authority over commercial fish farms in Puget Sound. Yeah. That being said, <laughs> When they issued a determination of non-significance, which basically says we do not feel there is a serious threat from the proposal that this company is putting forward, we felt like that was a mistake. Mm -hmm. We feel, as Wild Steelhead Coalition, as the larger fish conservation community, that that decision to issue a determination of non-significance was based on an outdated environmental impact statement. The environmental impact statement that Cook was leaning on for their proposal is from 1990. Wow. Why wow. would you think they wouldn't, uh, why would, I mean, WDFW is kind of holding the cards, you would think, and just simply say, well, you guys are going to have to uh, get an updated environmental impact study done. 
before we're able to even take a look at what you have going on here. Yep. And so what WDFW is saying is that once they, they did their in, their, in their terms, their due diligence, and they issued that determination of non-significance, that precludes a new environmental impact statement. It does not require a new EIS. Hmm. We feel that was a mistake. Yeah. We feel like there should have been, given Cook's track record and the operational failures that were very clear in 2017, um, given the, the new science around threats from commercial aquaculture in contained bodies of water like Puget Sound, and given the really precarious status of salmon and steelhead and orcas and other life in Puget right. Sound. I mean, we're talking about Endangered Species Act listed salmonids in this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We felt like that was a, a faulty decision. And that's, yeah. you know, again, I empathize with the leadership at WDFW. They were in a tough decision. They have limited decision-making authority over these fish farms and commercial aquaculture, but we felt like that issuance of a determination of non-significance and not requiring a new EIS, uh, that's not something we agree with. Sure. Do you feel like some of their decision to go ahead and allow the net pins is because of the fact that the agency runs similar operations with net pins in Puget Sound to raise, you know, salmon, coho, Chinook salmon, and other fish, you know? Mm -hmm. That was something we heard from leadership at the department, and, and I would put that in the category of, of things that, that we... Um, we hear them. I mean, that's right. a difficult management uh, position to be in where you are operating a form of aquaculture. Now, it's not commercial aquaculture. Right. Um, the tribes do operate commercial fin fish aquaculture, typically using native species, but mm -hmm. there are some proposals from uh, certain tribes to, to do new aquaculture production. Mm -hmm. um, we know that this isn't going to be a hard stop when it comes to sure. aquaculture in Puget Sound. In fact, right. we, we very much support shellfish aquaculture. That's it. A good sustainable yeah, and that's been going on benefits. for a long time. Yeah, exactly. I think so the biggest difference yeah. there is anything that WDFW is currently in or past practice has been involved in relative to agriculture is strictly uh, raising to a uh, level of smolt and releasing. They do not have any facility that's up and running that actually rears fish to adult right. for any type of market or sales. Right. Yeah. I think yeah. we could all agree on that. Right. So there is a significant yeah. difference in that regard. Um, so I'm just curious to see where this thing actually lands. I'm, you know, we Barnum and I delved into it last week, as you heard mm -hmm. or watched us, and and WFC has filed that lawsuit against them. And again, pointing out WDFW's position in this, along with uh, what we just spoke of, but the actual signing of the permit for the transport of the fish from one private entity mm -hmm. to another, but then to let that entity introduce them into Puget Sound. So it's more so the transport. Uh, I found that to be odd and interesting at the yep. same time. Yep, their authority is limited. Um, you know, Wild Steelhead Coalition is not Wild Fish Conservancy. You guys did a good job right. explaining that <laughs> distinction. And, yes. and we've all had plenty of cause to disagree with Wild Fish Conservancy on many, many issues. Sure. In this case, I'll, I'll say it right up front. I was glad to see that they sued. I think this is a good good example of where it's more They're the right the group to do it. Involved. They're the right group to do <laughs> yeah. it. They, right. they have uh, deep pockets they, yes. at some <laughs> levels, and they have the uh, lawyers in place to tackle stuff like this. So. But that's not the only area where, where approval is needed for this right, commercial right, aquaculture. Right. Uh, the Department of Ecology has to issue permits related to pollution impacts. We're going to mm -hmm. be in touch with them to make sure that there's the highest level of scrutiny for those pollution impacts. Right, right. And the, the State Department of Natural Resources, our Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, mm -hmm. she has to issue leases to allow these fish farms to operate in our public waters. In Puget Sound, right. yeah, now, public our, waters. Our public waters, the public benefit has to outweigh the public risk, and we right. are not convinced that that's the case. I would agree with that. Right, yep. and, and government agencies all around us, whether it's British Columbia or Oregon and California, are all passing yep. legislation to get, do away with it. Yep. So. And again, yep. it's not all fish farms. We know that the tribes are going to continue to operate some fish farms. We know that shellfish aquaculture is going to continue to be a rich part of our economy. We support a careful transition that allows folks to keep their jobs and support industry, but we don't think that given Cook's record and given the risks right. of commercial aquaculture to endangered species <laughs> and to salmon and steelhead recovery efforts, we, we don't think this is a good idea for Puget Sound. Gotcha. Right. Yep. Uh, let's move into something uh, that's also currently happening. You you bounce around a little bit from between Seattle and uh, down here in Olympia when you uh, when you have to, especially during lead session. Um, there's some things going on relative to WDFW budget. And the reason I lean on you, uh, Chase, I mean, I got to get uh, Nate Pamplin in here at some point to discuss truly WDFW budget. But you kind of have a great understanding about how money is generated, where funds come from and go to relative to their budget. Mm -hmm. If And you and I have talked about this. You look on social media, the majority, overwhelming majority, no matter how much effort we put in to help educate people on truly 
where when I go buy a fishing and hunting license, where that money goes, right. the the misnomer and everybody pay attention. Never ends. It yeah, it doesn't go into the general fund. I go buy a fishing license, it doesn't go into the general fund. Where does that money go, and then how does it utilize? That's that's right. So so Conservation Northwest sits on the state's budget and policy advisory group. I I and my 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 boss and others at our organization, along with many other organizations, the Mule Deer Foundation to CCA, many groups. We've been working on this issue since at least 2017, trying to be able to help the department get on stable footing when it comes to their budget. We all have disagreements over specific things, grievances, many of which are, are righteous. Um, but at the end of the day, we need a healthy agency to support our fish and wildlife and our outdoor heritage. Right. Um, you probably know this. I know others do probably are aware as well. Some may not. You know, we talk about the evergreen state and our commitment to our fish and wildlife. Right. Fish and wildlife make up less than half a percent of Washington State's budget. Think about that, the right. evergreen state, and yet we can't even give a full percentage of our $54 billion state budget. Yeah, or even 5%. Yeah. You know, I mean, let's go <laughs> for broke here, it's, you know? It's not. So, so getting to your question, right now, according to data from the department for this biennium, 2019 mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. 2021, and, and Nate is, is the ultimate expert yep. on this, what they report is about a third of the WDFW's budget comes from the general fund. So that's state tax dollars. That's that, that state budget that I just mentioned. Yep. About a third comes from our fishing and hunting licenses. I don't know about you guys. I spent about $300 oh a yeah. year buying just about everything. Right. Putting in for special permit points, all that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's more limits you can keep. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so about a third of the budget comes from sales of fishing and hunting licenses. Now, right. that has been declining as opportunities. Oh, right are lost, right. um, there's, there's national trends around decline in hunting participation, that share of the department's operating budget has been declining. Right. But like you were just getting at, it, it, you know, let me just be very clear on this, and there's plenty of data to back it up from the department. Uh, Andy Walgaman at Northwest Sportsman has done an excellent expose on this. Right. When you buy a hunting license, that money, 100% of it by federal law, mm -hmm. is required to go to the department. It goes to the department's wildlife account. Mm -hmm. That goes into managing elk, providing for hunting opportunities. That money does not go into the general fund. Correct. Right. The other third of the department's budget comes from federal grants. Now that's Pittman Robertson yeah, grants. So right. a lot of that money is coming from hunters mm -hmm. and anglers and recreational shooters. Some of it's Dingle Johnson grants, which is the, the federal excise tax on hunt, uh, fishing equipment and right. boat fuel. Right. So if you're just a recreational boater out there who likes maybe water skiing, you're supporting mm -hmm. our fish and wildlife resources. So basically you've got a third coming from hunting and fishing licenses, a third from the general fund, and a third from federal grants. But the hunting and fishing license segment is shrinking. The federal grant seg segment is shrinking, and as you all know, the department's mandate is getting broader. We need to see more yep. money coming in from the general fund. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I've heard, but I don't know if this has been uh, brought, brought forward or not, but there are those that are trying to write in, you know, introducing bills that would incorporate, you know, bird watchers and other types of outdoor activity users mm -hmm. uh, amongst the outdoors in Washington State to contribute to monies going in to manage, because... In certain levels, some of this stuff is all managed through WDFW, but there's nobody on in those other entities that are paying anything into WDFW. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting topic. We could spend all night on oh, this yeah. looking at other examples from other states. But at the end of the right. day, that the root of it is we need to find new revenue streams right. so that if you're a bird watcher or you're a mountain biker, you're mm -hmm. a hiker, you're enjoying our public lands, you're enjoying seeing wildlife, you know, you're spending time in wildlife right. habitat, you're having an impact. We need to find ways to support these resources so it's not just from the general fund and it's not just from hunters and anglers. Yep. Now, for now, I, I think the short-term answer is increased revenue from the state general fund. Right. Let's bring that 0.5% up to 1% or 5%. Well, we haven't we but, haven't bounced it back up since the, de the right. recession or decline from 2008, 2010. They rolled those numbers back substantially and they haven't, they exactly haven't brought right. it back up yep. to 100% of funding. Yep. Whatever that number was out of the general fund, it's not even close to what it used to be, right? That's exactly and right. And when you add inflation and, and all that uh, years down the road, it actually that number needs to be way, way higher. And we're glad that there's not a big debate happening over a fishing and hunting license fee this session. You know, it was 
pretty clear how that turned yeah, out last year. Right but on. it is fair to say that our hunting and fishing licenses have not increased since 2011. They have not tracked with numbers inflation. wise. So that's a, yeah. that's another debate that'll need, probably need to be had in future sessions. And what you brought up is is another interesting element. Is there a way to do a watchable wildlife stamp? Mm -hmm. Is there a specific you know very small sales tax? There was an idea around that proposed last year. 0.02 percent. It was basically a dollar on a $500 purchase. Right. This is the idea put forward. Only purchases above $200. So trying to find other revenue streams so right. that we can spread this funding around. And, and folks that, that really do care about wildlife and public lands, they can directly support them. Right. Right. There's, right. You know, for this session, I wouldn't get too hung up on that. Um, it's, a, it's a discussion that needs to happen. We need to have the right level of outreach with the outdoor industry, the recreation community, other groups, but the need is out there. Yeah. Right. So look for that in future sessions. For this session, we need more support from the state general fund. We have yep. a viewer question that I'm kind of interested in. Do we know where the Discover Pass funds go? Do those go into the general fund or to DNR? Those are divvied up, and, and I think you'd have to talk to the agencies to get the exact percentages, but those right. are divvied up between WDFW and state parks and potentially DNR. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. To get the percentages, I, I ask you to go to the agencies. But yeah, good question. Those are where yeah. they're divvied up. That's a great question. Uh, okay, I want to delve into the acquired land over there, um, Grand Ron, but I'm going to save that because as we're talking about things going on, on the east side, I'm just going to kind of roll that into uh, our discussion later on. Okay. So we're running a little behind. We're going to uh, jump out for a quick break. We got more with Chase Canal. We're going to introduce uh, Oren later on in the show as well. He's from Okanagan County over there and has a good grasp on things going on relative to the mule deer migration and problematic issues of all these deer being killed on the highway to the tune of one per day, 365 a year, Barnum. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, that's how many days are in a year? 365? Pretty what about cool. a leap year? Mm. Is that 366 or 364? <laughs> <laughs> well, just really guy. quick, one last thing in the budget for yeah. folks to be aware of. So we're looking at um, the state's report of how much money, the revenue report, that came in today. It looks oh, that's like the right. state's yes. doing pretty well. So Thank we're looking at more than six, $606 million in additional revenue this year. Wow. That's going to be helpful for budget writers that are working on their budgets right now. Hopefully by this time next week we'll know whether legislators across the state actually do care about our fish and wildlife and are willing to fulfill. $600 million. Out of $600 million in additional revenue, you think they can find $26 million for fish and wildlife. You would think. Let's Ins hope. Inslee oh, before we get off that, huh? Inslee needs a lot more money to fly around, though. Before we get off that, though, <laughs> uh, Chase, that, the $26 <laughs> million only gets us through from March till December. That's right. So this is the, the ask from the department for this year. Um, it gets us through this biennium. It does not provide new or better services. It doesn't nope. provide like a catch reporting app that nope. many people have asked for. It's right. just to provide for basic services this biennium. That's right. So look for this conversation to happen again next legislative session. We have to get our fish and wildlife away from these one-time funding asks yep. and get them some dedicated funding so they can um, do their jobs. You yeah. know, again, we I all agree. have grievances with the department, yeah. all things disagreements with, but it doesn't make sense for them to go to Olympia every session every with their year. hands out. No, absolutely. So more Good news stuff. coming next week. Look for that. Perfect. Well, if, uh, if I don't get you on the phone, we'll get the info from you anyway and we'll get it out right. there. Yeah, so. Maybe you guys can get Nate or someone from the department on here. That'd be Possibly. Great. Right. Yeah. I'm sure they're busy. Perfect. Uh, okay, we're going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. We're actually going to be in the kitchen for a fantastic recipe of the week. Uh, sesame seared albacore tuna in ponzu sauce. This is a favorite. This is a classic. <laughs> this is one, it's a little premature, but get ready for either tuna season that's coming and or get some of those tuna loins out of the freezer. We still have a handful that we're going to grab. And uh, this is an easy recipe that Chef does. It's going to um, take you about 10 minutes to prepare this, and it is fantastic. So we'll get to some sesame seared albacore tuna and ponzu sauce when we come back right here on FHN right after this break. Allied boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Deep V 21 degree dead rise at the transom guarantees a smooth ride no matter the conditions. Allied offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five year top to prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Allied boats range from 19 to 32 foot in length, so no matter what type of heavy gauge boat you are looking for, we have it for you. All of our Corsair 21 foot and larger designs come standard with reverse chine that is welded inside and out with no extrusions below the waterline. 
so that you will never have to worry about corrosion problems down the road. Get out on the water today in a boat that you can trust and enjoy with Allied Boats. Contact us at Allied Boats today to learn much more about our incredible fishing machines. Welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We're here in the kitchen with Chef Kelly, and I believe we have some coho salmon. Yes, you caught the coho salmon, okay. I was yeah. going to ask you if you did. Oh my God. I already <laughs> know the answer, because yep. yeah, you're like, look how big my coho is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you saw all the pictures. I know. Yeah. yeah. That was a fun trip. The phone doesn't ring. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, so today we're going to be making a signature dish. This is going to be a pan-seared coho. It's going to be over cabbage, apples, potatoes, onions, with a apple white wine sauce. Okay. Okay? This is not yeah. a traditional recipe. Okay, so uh, as you can see back here, I've already kind of pre-started my salmon, and I want to touch on that is that, that cohos are, are easy okay. to overcook. Usually they're kind of on the thin, kind of smaller side. Right. Uh, I, ch I chose a tailpiece. And so this is a good way, technique, to try to uh, get ahead without overcooking mm -hmm. them. So we're just going to finish it up on the other side, and that way we're going to ensure that we're not going to be overcooking our fish. Okay. Okay, because over overcooked salmon is garbage, right? So we're going to start uh, sauteing our apple, our sauce first. Okay. So we're going to use, this is a whole apple. This is a uh, Fuji apple, it's one of my favorites, but there's a lot of great apples out there nowadays. So, so you we just start, diced it? Yeah, just okay. small dice. So we're going to use half of it here and the other half here. Okay. Okay. Yep. There we go. Okay, and we're going to use two different types of onions for the saute. We're going to do yellow onion. That's okay. about oh, half a cup. Small dice. Another half a cup of red onion. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and I okay. pre-cooked my potato Yukon ahead of time. Yukon gold? Right, uh, Yukon gold. This is okay. about two peeled, of course. Okay. So we're going to season both of these. Boom, boom. Kosher salt always. A little bit of black pepper. Give you an arm workout. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, for our sauce, for our sauce, we're going to be using um, apple butter. You know, and that, oh. yeah, an apple butter, um, I don't know if you can see this, it's kind of like a good like a caramelized uh, applesauce, right? Okay. It's kind of reduced, it's very thick. Um, yeah, quite here, a bit thicker here. than applesauce. Take a little taste. Okay. Mm. What do you think? Yeah. Like, right? So if, if you couldn't get a hold like on it. this, I would caramelize a little bit of sugar, add some applesauce, you're good to go, you're right there. So you can use your kid's applesauce? <laughs> yes, you can raise your kids' <laughs> applesauce. Just make it a little bit sweeter. <laughs> That's really good. Right? And you can find that just in the regular grocery store? Yeah, I found that in the, uh, I found this actually in the jelly aisle. Oh, okay. Okay, so there you go. The aisle you were in forever? Shh. <laughs> you know, I I'm like, where did I, Kelly go? I sense all this judgment, you know? <laughs> I and said, you're always leaving the cart behind. I'm like, where's our cart? <laughs> we'll put the GPS on it next time, okay? <sighs> okay, so we added our potatoes, getting them crispy, getting nice and translucent. Okay. So we're going to add about uh, three quarters of a cup of white you, wine. You poured that away from you. Yeah, make sure you... You were kind of close to your body that time. 
That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> as long as it didn't get the beard, you know, we're good. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know all about those beards. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, we're almost there. Okay. So, we're going to add a little bit of... Actually, I'm going to add our, our uh, cabbage. So, this is just regular... Shredded old shredded, cabbage. Shredded cabbage. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to wilt down a lot. So, that's about a cup and a half. Okay. Right there. Okay. Talk to me about that Puget Sound coho, huh? Well, it was in the Everett Derby. Everett and, Derby? Yeah, and I caught the biggest one in the boat. In the boat? Wow. Yes. You saw the pictures. I it was saw this the, big. Well, I thought you were like, you know, <laughs> Bill dancing it out here. No, you know? I wasn't. No, you no. Know? no. <laughs> okay. Then Dwayne had to hold mine at one point. I'm like, give me my fish. <laughs> 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 it was fun. It was fun? Very fun time. Okay, good. Yeah. Sounds like a good couples therapy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we worked through everything out there on that boat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're almost reduced down here. We're getting there. All right. All right, so let's clear off this right here. Okay, we're going to add just a little bit of chopped garlic here in the finish. Or do and you our pan want that cabbage? No, Sorry. I'm good. Okay. Yeah. That's a lot of garlic. <laughs> Garlic's good for you. Come At on. At least in that. Yeah. Okay, looking a little dry. So we're going to add just a lid, touch more oil. Okay. Okay, our wine is reduced now. So now we're going to add our... Oh. Give just me that. I think you just gave that to me. <laughs> so, one, we're going to add two tablespoons of the apple butter. Okay. And now you can take it back, okay? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's switch our utensils out. Okay. Okay, that's going to have some residual heat. And we're already plating. That looks great. Right? Already so we're gonna, plating? Yeah, already plating. Wow. Okay, I'm adding about oh, a tablespoon of butter. Just give a little bit of richness. Okay. Okay. You can see our fish is already getting warm on that Smells side. Smells awesome. Okay. Okay, and we're just going to let that residual heat take that over the top. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you see how the butter has given a little, uh, little creaminess to it. Okay, you we're going to... the potatoes a little bit. Yeah. Mmm, smells good. Yes, it does. Lots of garlic. There we go. Looking good. Take our nice, beautiful coho. Wow. <laughs> Don't glare at me like that, mister. I didn't glare. It wasn't a glare, okay? You know? <laughs> Jealousy. Okay. And then just a little bit of chives. chives. And uh, yeah, I would, I would serve this in any one of my restaurants. Okay. There you go. All right. Pan seared coho, guys, with an apple white wine sauce with cabbage, onions, and potatoes. That is awesome. And we're going to dig in. But as we do that, we're going to throw it back to you guys in the studio. Awesome. Yep. A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride right here in Bremerton, Washington. 
Arima Boats offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. With literally thousands of Arima boats on the water throughout the Pacific Northwest, Arima boats are a proven hull design that offers incredible fuel economy and all of the amenities that a serious angler is looking for. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Arima boats are designed to maximize deck space while also providing ample seating. Contact us today at Arima Boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water. Hey, welcome back to Fish on Northwest. Got a full studio now, definitely. Julia Smith, thank you so much for coming. Glad you were here. Thank you so much for having me. It's uh, our pleasure, trust me. Tom, nice to see you again, man. Good to see yeah. you guys, nice too. To yeah. yeah, great. That we got some blacktail to talk about. <sighs> yeah. Do you have a seminar coming up? I Any do seminar? not. I actually have no seminars this fall set up. No, I'm so actually, ain't going to kill a deer. How am I going to kill a deer? I have to do a private seminar? Yeah. <laughs> he needs all the help he can get. Well, we can talk. This is true. Just tell me where your cameras are and we'll figure it out. Okay. <laughs> uh, you will be happy to know I've elevated this year. I'm up in a tree platform versus ground blind for blacktail. Okay. So I'm not out on a foot as you would be. But, so you're you know, up in your game a little bit. Yeah, I'm up know. in my game. Good deal. No pun literally. intended. Yeah, yeah, literally. Julia Smith, uh, WDFW Wolf Coordinator. I told you when you uh, hit the front step there, I go, you're a hard lady to find. <laughs> she keeps it, uh, you know, her social media platform is pretty uh, underground, so. I'm new in Washington, so yes, you may you not are. have the presence. No. Let's, uh, let's just real quickly remind folks of that. So previously, five years or so down Arizona, New Mexico, wolf management, your position there, and uh, what, what were you doing with wolves down there? Sure. I worked for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, mm -hmm. and I was most recently employed there as the field supervisor for the state of Arizona. So I was managing our field team 
directing all the field activities in the state of Arizona and doing all the population monitoring, mm -hmm. wolf collaring, trapping, um, following them around, keeping them away from livestock, working with livestock producers to prevent conflict, mm -hmm. basically driving around in a field truck all day, and it was a great job. You liked it. I loved it. And you had sunny weather. Oh, yeah. I missed that. Um, <laughs> real quickly, just a little history in that regard for that area that you were uh, working. So wolves were completely exterminated out of the area back when? Oh, gosh. So their history is quite a bit different oh, from wolves is. in Washington. Okay. So I want to make sure that we don't yeah. conflate the two. Sure. So this is just your wolves in the southwest. That's Arizona, New Mexico, okay. and even Mexico, actually. They were completely eradicated, and the last five animals were trapped from the wild in Mexico, put in captivity, and then the entire wild population that exists today in Arizona and New Mexico from comes wolves. from those wow. individuals. Is that right? So it's a totally different situation from what we have here in Washington. So they basically bred those in captivity and repopulated the landscape with wolves. That's right. A full on recovery plan of capture of what remained in the wild and built the program to where it is today. When you left, That's do you right. know what the population was down there? Yeah, it was 117 individuals minimum, and then their most recent minimum count was 131, so right in line with where Washington is, okay. only it divides the two states, Arizona and New Mexico. It's about right along the state line. Genetically, there. any difference in those wolves, Yes, right? quite a bit quite different. A bit, yeah. Washington's wolves are genetically robust, healthy. There's genetic interchange mm -hmm. among several different populations. Yeah. Um, it's not the case for Mexican wolves in Arizona and New Mexico. That's a closed population, and so those animals oh. are incredibly <clears throat> genetically inbred, and they face recovery challenges that we don't have here mm. in Washington. These wolves up here are bigger? They are, are they bigger, not? Yeah. yep. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so a little history from down there, just so folks know that this isn't your first uh, wolf rodeo just coming up no. here to Washington. I'm new to Washington, but I am not Correct. new to wolves. So, so I wanted to make sure people understand that. Um, what in the heck would draw you from the sunny warmth of the South to come up to Washington State and, and manage wolves? Do I? I can't believe. Okay, we've got <laughs> the mountains, we've yeah. got the ocean, right. we've got the rivers, right. we've got the forest. Right. I mean, do I need to say no, anything I, else? I, I've, I've this is the most here. beautiful state yeah. I've ever seen. Perfect. And I came here some years back mm -hmm. and wasn't here for very long, but it left a deep impression on me. I always thought awesome. if I had the chance to move here, I would do it. Perfect. So WDFW since about November of last year, December, November, December, if I remember right? Like yeah, as, yeah uh, I came on in November last year. You were hired as the WDFW Wolf Coordinator. Correct? I was. It's mm -hmm. a new position, and right. it was hired mostly to work on uh, processes around writing uh, environmental planning documents for processes like wolf translocation and wolf post-recovery planning. Gotcha. But lar generally, you can say I work on wolf policy. Okay. So I kind of covered that the wolves were pretty much eradicated and trapped and rebuilt the program down south. Let's talk a little history on the misconception here in Washington State. Um, Barnum and I joke about this all the time. Everybody thinks that WDFW had this huge cage and they took it out <laughs> there in the middle of the mountains on the northeast quadrant of our state oh, and they really? opened it up and set the wolves free and said, we now have wolves. I've heard all, right. all sorts of stories from black helicopters to black suburbans. To, oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, we've heard it all and these were yeah. midnight. Yeah. You can't talk about it and they killed witnesses and all this stuff. So what's the true story of the timeline of the wolf in Washington State? Take us down that timeline. Sure. Well, let's go way back, mm -hmm. right? Let's go back through the history of the state. Wolves are native in Washington. Mm -hmm. They used to exist in the state statewide. People say, how, how do you know that? There are excellent records, actually mostly through trapping and bounty records, because bounties on wolves are in a lot of the states, some of the first laws that were ever enacted oh, yeah. in state governments and county governments were actually wolf bounties. So there's bounty records for wolves across the state from the western coast, the Olympic Peninsula, all the way to the east side. So we do know that wolves were native in the state and they're also surrounded by other places that have native wolf populations, Canada, the Rocky Mountains, uh, down into the rest of the Pacific Northwest, Oregon, California. So mm -hmm. that's the history. So in the 1850s up through 1900s, that was the years that during settlement of this area, when wolves were basically hunted to extinction, trapped out, bounties, that kind of thing, they were eradicated yeah. from the state. And so the last known wolf in the state, so they disappeared by the 1930s. Do they know 
or do they have a guess, perhaps, what the populations of the wolves would have been back in the turn of the 1900s? There's, to my knowledge, mm -hmm. there aren't good estimates yeah. of that. You can read some estimates. Probably our best resource on that really historical information is Young and Goldman, 1946. Mm. They wrote two pretty comprehensive volumes of wolf records. And although there's a lot of things missing, like how many wolves did the state support, they don't we don't have good records sure. of that. But if you want to read some of their initial accounts of what was on the landscape, and not just in Washington, but across the nation, that's your best resource. And those are way old, out of print, but you can find them if you're lucky in okay. some mm. bookstores. But anyway, so wolves are gone in the state by the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And then around the early 1990s, there were rumblings of dispersing animals coming to the state, lone wolves coming through, and reports that probably were legitimate, but you know, states count a population when they document breeding in the state. Right, and right. so the first breeding pack wasn't documented until 2008, although we know probably there was wolf presence here earlier than that, but you actually have to document, okay, is this a pair, does it have pups? Right, and I think that's important to put out there because I see all the time also is hunters saying, well, I saw a wolf on this and I reported it and the state denies whether or not they're there and they're lying to us. They know they're there, but they right. won't say it. But you guys have guidelines you have to follow before you confirm a wolf is in that area or a pack is in that area, correct? Exactly, and there's, there's definitions of what all these things mean. A pack has a definition. That's two or more animals traveling together. Okay. A breeding pair has a definition. That's two or more animals that have, or well, it's a pair, right? But right. they have to have at least two offspring that survive okay. to the end of the year. And so you might look at a group of four wolves and say, okay, that's a breeding pair just based on what we know of wolf biology. But these things do have definitions. And so maybe we'll show our pack map later on or you can see mm -hmm. where they are. But that doesn't mean that you can never see a wolf anywhere else right. in the state. Sure. Wolves can travel hundreds of miles. Right. And the real truth is that you could possibly see a wolf anywhere in the state. Mm. Now, does that mean that they're a resident? Does that mean that they live there? Does that mean they hold a territory there? Right. Does that mean they raise young there? No, not necessarily. A sure. uh, question coming in here from uh, Matt Berger. He's curious if genetically the wolves that we have now would genetically be linked to the wolves that were here in the early 1900s, late 1800s. So that's a tough question to answer because, you know, we've lost so many animals right. since then. But I think the simplest answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of debate among scientists about how many subspecies of wolves mm -hmm. were there. And especially in Washington, a big yeah. topic is whether there was a coastal wolf that was right. different, that relied oh, on salmon, yeah, like I've you see that, in the yes, Alexander yeah. Archipelago, mm -hmm. and right. whether that same wolf existed here. Right. So there's a lot of talk about how many different subspecies there are, but there's not debate about what species was here. And gotcha. that's the gray wolf. Okay. And so that gray wolf lived all the way up from Canada, all the way south into Mexico. Okay. So even that wolf of the southwest, yeah. it's a different subspecies, but it's still a gray wolf, Canis right. lupus. And <laughs> so those animals, although there would have been gradations and differences as you change in climate and terrain and prey adaptations, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, sure, there's local adaptations, but it is one species, Canis lupus. Right, because another thing that we hear a lot of times is the wolves that were reintroduced to the west, which they are a different breed of wolf. They're a bigger wolf, stronger wolf. They yeah. take more feed. So you're saying that's not actually the yeah, case. Like and this is the same genetic string of wolf yeah. that would have been here 100 years ago. Right, and right. that's a connected population. Right. So okay. that, that one's a myth. And also, if that's what folks think, well, our wolves in Washington are, you know, a, a normal male's 90 pounds, normal female's about uh, 80 pounds. So okay. that's not a monster wolf. That's just right. a normal wolf. Yeah. And that's your average here. A 160-pound wolf can take down an elk by itself. Yeah. Right. They're here. Right. <laughs> well, and I would say probably what you'll notice is, and I don't, you probably know the name of, of the science behind that, but... You know, as you move farther north, species begin yeah. to grow larger. Bird so it only rule. okay. <laughs> so it only makes sense that the wolf in this area wouldn't be the 200-pound wolf that you have in the Yukon. Well, yeah. and and again, this critter, there's gradations. Think historically, if you have an animal that exists all across all of North America, mm -hmm. think about the differences that you'd see. Just like the same With differences we see in elk deer tails. population. Right. I mean, I, I've been exactly. in northern Alberta, and these white tails are absolute giants. Sure. And you go to southern Arizona, and coos deer, little cows tiny deer, guys. little yeah. tiny guys, yeah, little mm -hmm. dudes. So I mean, and, and even black tails, we see the difference between California deer and, and yep. Oregon Willamette Valley, and even up here into the peninsula, and, and even in antler configurations. So right. Genetically, same animal, 
geographically adaptations. I mean, that's adaptations just what and evolution yes. specific to their their, their region. Right, yeah, right, obviously, right. right? So, a yeah. um, couple things referencing the recovery plan. So, was it at 2008? I'm looking at a graph here that shows me a population from 2008. We had five up to now 2018 when that was uh, recorded 126. Mm -hmm. So, prior to 2008. It, as you mentioned, like in the 90s, there were sightings. People mm -hmm. say, I'm pretty sure I saw a wolf, right? Mm -hmm. Was it when WDFW field biologists were out there looking, putting in time, actually found and documented breeding pair to say, hey, we have five wolves that we've confirmed. Now we're going to track these wolves and keep track of them or what's going on. Is that when then efforts were put in to develop a recovery plan or was it prior to that? It was actually prior to that. Okay. It, the process to start began in 2007. Oh. And so the state was being a little proactive there saying, okay, we've got to have a wolf conservation and management plan. We know these animals are coming into the state. Right. Obviously, you know, wolves, wherever they exist in this country, are a controversial species. Mm -hmm. So we need to have guidelines about that will guide how we manage them here in the state of Washington. So that plan started development in 2007, and it took till 2011. So it took five years to develop, and that process was guided by a stakeholder group as well, at that time called the Wolf Working Group, that mm -hmm. consisted of stakeholders including environmentalists, livestock producers, hunters, and those without affiliations. And so it's a long, uh, a long involved process to develop a wolf plan that works for everybody. Um. As it's moving forward now, um, obviously, you know, the numbers have varied a little bit as we were talking prior to the show. Uh, the state has removed nine from the landscape this year alone mm -hmm. due to problems um, uh, with, you know, a handful of different issues over in that northeast quadrant. So um, it's, it would seem that it's hard to manage the wolves to get to that recovery plan goal if we have to keep eliminating them. So. What, what is the recovery plan? Yeah, that that's, a, that's a great question. So, again, wolf mortality is actually modeled in, in that 2011 wolf conservation and management plan. And you actually have to reach a certain percentage of mortality. I think it's 28% before you, you start seeing dips. So okay. agency removal of wolves is actually, uh, we consider an impact to recovery before moving forward on any of those actions. And so, and if you look again at the last 10 years, mm -hmm. you see an upward trajectory that actually represents an average of 28% growth per year. Per year, Now, yeah. is that steady growth no you know certainly in the early years you see faster growth dip, as yeah. wolves recolonize open habitat right. in the more recent years there's some slower growth but again it's an average of 28 mm percent -hmm. and we see that as an upward trajectory not only in number of individual wolves but also packs and breeding pairs gotcha. and we also see distribution of wolves in the state moving westward and this year is actually the first year that a wolf pack was documented west of the cascade crest since Ex extirpation from the state. So that's a huge That deal. happened this year in 2019? That happened to 2018. Oh, 2018. As of the last survey. Okay. Yep. okay. Well, that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Back up a little bit for people, and we always talk about wolf delisting in Washington. Mm -hmm. What are those three zones, and where do we have to be criteria-wise in those three zones before we can even talk about management of wolves? Yeah, great question. So the 2011 Conservation and Management Plan uh, shows three different zones. You've got Eastern Washington, mm -hmm. you've got Northern Cascades, and then you've got Southern Cascades and uh, the western coast and so that um, those three zones it, uh, according to the plan to get to the stage where you could down or delist wolves each of those recovery zones has to have a minimum of four breeding pairs mm -hmm. plus three anywhere in the state for a minimum of three years three consecutive years or four in each zone plus six anywhere in the state for a minimum of one year. Huh. And so in the eastern recovery zone, that's where the majority of the wolves in the state live. That's where almost all of them right. live. Right. There were 12 breeding pairs in that zone. Mm. So that is three times the regional component of that recovery right. objective. Right. And then you've got three in that northern Cascades recovery zone. So one more until you have that uh, objective of four breeding pairs. Right. And then the southern 
Northern Cascades and Northwest Coast, wolves just haven't got to yet. And sure. that's not to say that they aren't around. Right. The individual wolves don't disperse there. So if folks have seen wolves, that is absolutely possible. Mm. Wolves disperse hundreds of miles and you right. could see them. But in order for us to document those breeding pairs, we need to actually have wolves holding territory and and. Have, breeding. Yeah, and, and breeding. <laughs> exactly. And then you can count them. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. I think it's just that they haven't got there yet. Sure. I don't right. think it's anything preventing them, so but they haven't done it yet. You're seeing that cluster of population in the northeast corner. Do you feel that, that the migration from there across the rest of the state has happened in the time that you guys figured it would, or is it going slower than what you expect or quicker? <laughs> it's an interesting question. So the original plan, again, the model, the population model that gives us our prediction said it should happen by 2021. Okay. So we're not there yet. All it's right. 19. Okay. So when 2021 happens, will we be there? I don't know the Hard answer to, say, to that right? question. Yeah. It's right. kind of a okay, crystal good. ball, but I, th I think all of our biologists in the state are confident that mm -hmm. it will happen. I'm confident that it will happen. Will it happen by 2021? I don't know that. Right. Let's, uh, we're going to hover right there for a bit. We're at a, we're at a point where we understand we have a, a uptick of average of 28% per year. We have a goal that was originally put into the plan in 2011 for 2021 to hopefully meet our goals in the three quadrants that we've recognized mm -hmm. um, for the numbers of breeding pair that we need. We're going to tie all that in. Also want to talk age of wolves, like average age, lifespan expectancy. It's going to be a lot lower than most of you think. Do they breed like rats? Do like they breed like shoulders? rats? Multiple <laughs> litters a year, uh, you know, like a, like a uh, puppy pound. Um, right. there's, there's a lot of things uh, involving numbers. I want to kind of get all that lumped into a, a package here that I think we can do. So we're going to jump out for a quick break. We're going to take a little break from the wolf talk. <laughs> The wolf talk and uh, we're gonna jump in the bait lab uh, break down for you a simple rigging process for finding success going out bobber dogging for coho if you are simply throwing plugs pitching spinners or twitching jigs you're probably finding some fish but you may be surprised on certain rivers how good the egg bite is for coho if you're not doing it you're missing out I'm gonna show you how to set up and be uh, productive bobber dogging for coho we come back right here on FHM. Defines boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Defines boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. Defines boats feature a 21 to 22 degree dead rise at the transom and a large reverse chine for incredible handling and stability offshore. Defines boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Defines boats feature fuel efficient hull designs with large fuel tank capacity so that you can have maximum fuel range for making long offshore runs completely safe and affordable. All Defines boats come standard with self-bailing decks for improved safety while at sea. Defines boat offers all our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Defines boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water.
Hey, welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We're here in the Bait Lab. Uh, Bait Lab is now presented by Max Lure. Happy to have them on board. I mean, they're doing a fantastic job and we are uh, very happy to be teamed up with them. So uh, I have here basically a nice uh, wild coho salmon that was caught here a couple days ago. Um, basically snatch this thing out of the river on a uh, jingling jig. So for what that's worth, um, just want to kind of run through a real simple way for me to fillet out this fish. Uh, I like trying to get as many bones out of the fish as I can when I either grill it, put it on the Traeger, cut it up into smaller chunks for smoking, whatever it is. You know, one thing about the, the uh, presentation on your fish, no matter how you cook it or present it, is how it palates and not having to pick bones out of your, your mouth or your teeth. Especially if you're trying to convert people into enjoying fish, boneless is definitely something that uh, will steer them in the right direction. So first thing I do, this is a fish that's been gutted at the river. Um, if you look at this fish, it's extremely healthy. I mean, the, the thick uh, belly walls on this thing are just lined with fat, okay? So when you're filleting out your salmon, um, you know, you want to do your due diligence and not remove all the fat out of the bottom end of this meat, whether you're grilling or smoking or whatever it is. This is a very healthy fish, early uh, in river, just out of the salt, with a lot of its fat, nutrient, and oil still in the meat. It's very red, it's a nice buck. Um, as we fillet this out, we don't want to get rid of all that, so you got to kind of be careful with how you remove those rib bones and get that stuff out of there. One thing that you can do to make it easier for you is you start by just simply getting rid of uh, these external fins because they just kind of get in your way as you're dragging that fillet knife through there. I'll take these uh, lower fins out of here and hope I don't cut my finger. If I cut off a finger at any point, we may uh, change, our, change our program here. So we're just getting these fins out of the way. Makes it a lot easier to fillet this thing out, okay? And I'll just remove whichever ones I feel like need to go because, again, they're just in the way. Now, this one has been opened up at the belly cavity. For some, it's really easy just to come behind the collar here, 45 on the knife, and go down the backbone. And if you remove that and you flip the fish over, uh, now you're going to fillet it against a backbone that's laying flat down on a board and it's not in a neutral position. So a lot of times you end up hacking up that other side of the fillet. It doesn't work well for you. If you struggle with that, one thing you can do is simply take the knife, go in through the belly here on the top side of the backbone. For me, I like to start with the blade uh, going towards the tail, okay? So now I'm just gonna run this and definitely have a sharp knife, all right? Gonna run this down. I'm not gonna cut it all the way through. I use that as a pickup point. I'll show you that in a second. Now I turn the knife around get it in there on the backbone where it was before, and now we're just gonna run this up towards the head, all the way up, okay? Now, because I haven't removed this, I can simply flip that fish over, all right? So, now, the reason you do that is that slab underneath there helps keep that backbone in a neutral plane. I'm not having to worry about carving down or against it. It doesn't naturally take my knife down into the backbone, uh, which becomes problematic. So now I'm gonna take this same exact way on the top side of the backbone, and we're gonna go towards the tail, okay? It's held that uh, spine in a neutral position, so I'm not wasting a lot of meat. Come back up, figure out where that line is, and I got it right there. Okay, so basically these are cut off both sides. Now I can go ahead and just finish this side here. I don't want the collar on, so I'm gonna poke this on through right there and cut back up towards the head at about a 45. Cut that through, okay? And I just roll that right off there. Really nice clean fillet from top to bottom. Turns out real nice. Turn this one over, poke this through at the fin, at the collar. Bring that up towards the head, okay? Again, I'll finish the tail here, okay? Two fillets. Now, you can see not a lot left on this fish at all. If you wanna save those collars, you can on these coho of about 12 pounds. There's not a ton of meat left on those. I haven't wasted a whole lot of meat. So, drop those off. So now, I have two really nice fillets here, okay? I have a little bit of cleanup to do. I look at the top here. I'm gonna go ahead and leave like this right up here, this top fat, I'm gonna leave that in there because for cooking that just makes sense. This one here is pretty clean. 
Now I'm looking at my rib bones, okay? So I used this knife as my knife to cut down the backbone and through the rib bone. So it's, you know, it's got a sharp edge, but to get these rib bones off of this flesh, I'm gonna get another blade that has a little more flexibility to it and is extremely sharp. Now, one thing I can tell you as we look down on this is if I run this along here, and I think I'm gonna take all that out at the same time, what you end up doing, I had mentioned this belly fat before, and you can see all this belly fat down at the bottom here. You don't wanna remove all that with the skin. Those rib bones stop right about there. There's no reason for me to cut all this out of here. I want those fats and oils to be in there when we're cooking this fish. So uh, the way I do this is it's important. You wanna grab this top edge of these bones, okay? Really sharp knife, and I'm just gonna make a, kind of a starter cut all the way down along right here, okay? I'm also gonna come back to the top and make sure I get this, I'm capturing this front edge of every one of those bones to make sure I don't end up cutting through them. Now, with a little pressure on the meat and exaggerating, rotating this blade upwards almost at a 45, okay? I draw the knife down the bones uh, at a, a section at a time. So I'm gonna work my way through the bones versus trying to scoop it out. It's when I scoop it out that I end up cutting through this belly wall and I don't wanna get rid of all that. So uh, get back up here to capture this bone right here. Again, now I'm just basically drawing it along here, okay, and I hold it flat. And by doing that, again, really sharp knife, and now I come up and I remove all that, and it's left a lot of meat on that belly, okay? Now I got the opposite side to do. Take this one here, and same thing, but it's kind of opposite, but you just want to go along those rib bones. And again, we don't want to take too much at a time. And if I angle the knife slightly up, you can feel it run along those bones, leaving as much of that meat and fat on there as we can, okay? And it's just work your way through nice and easy. You don't have to be in a hurry on this or you just waste too much meat, all right? I see guys that go after it and they take big, big strides at once and they end up cutting a lot of that belly meat out of there. So. That right there is leaving a majority of that, and it actually comes back up towards all that. All that fat is left on that belly, which when it comes to smoking and grilling, that is ideal. So now, here's where we get the pin bones out, okay? So now I have this, we'll do this side. Okay, and we're just gonna do one here to get through this process. Pin bones run on this high ridge. You can barely make them out. Maybe if I put them center here, you can see the top edges of these. And they go about almost, it goes beyond half. It's about two thirds of your filet on this top ridge has these pin bones. Now, those go in and they're angled back towards the uh, high back of the fish. So I take another small blade and I wanna cut the small side, what ends up being my small side of my cut first. And I'm simply gonna find that pin bone line and I'm going to, with the knife pointing down towards the, the, the top of the back, okay, I'm gonna run that knife right along those pin bones. And you can feel them right along that blade. And I'm not pushing down really hard on the knife, I'm just letting the very sharp knife and the weight of the knife just kind of drag along the pin bones. And you wanna feel it, it just kind of goes tick, 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 tick along the bones. And it's important that I leverage the knife towards the top of the fish that allows it to stay on that pin bone line and draw. So let me turn this around and do it this way. So I'm, I'm looking at that, I'm on the high side and I am simply cutting down that, that pin bone line, okay? And I can, I can see most of them, but the majority of them, I'm just feeling as it goes along the way here, okay? So as that cuts down and I just take several swipes at it, it doesn't have to all be at once, all right? And we wanna get clear to the back here. I can feel them all the way back here on the ridge. Okay, we're moving along. Cut those down, cut those down. And once you get past the bones, you can literally push that on through the skin and you've now cut that slab out. So that top piece right there 
is pretty much bone free. You might miss a couple back in here, but those bones are right here in this ridge. So now on the inside of this cut, I look at where these bones are and I'm just gonna draw this down along the pin bones. Now you might think, well, we're wasting too much meat, but I assure you when this is done, because it's just the knife dragging along the bones uh, with a little bit of flesh intact, yeah, you can wait and you can pull each one of these out by a plier and when they break off, as most of them do, you get kind of pissed off and you know, half of them are buried in there. Uh, I can run this down now through the skin, okay, and all the way through. And now I get down to the bottom in here, simple angle cut, back on the skin, maybe carve that out of there, and there you go. So now when I go to uh, cook this up, all right, I, if I'm gonna grill this, I simply just push this back together, basically like that, which helps keep the moisture in there. Um, if I was to cook this and leave that hanging out like that, it's probably going to dry this piece out a little too fast. But I can assure you, after grilling several fish this way, just with that pushed up against there nice and tight, seasoned up, oiled, and whatnot, uh, that thing cooks up every bit as good as if, you know, this little strip of flesh is in there. And if you look at that, and that's even a little thicker than I normally do, but that did not waste a whole lot of meat. I mean, that is, for me, that is worth getting those pin bones out of there. And I have a nice fillet. Now, if I go to cut this up, I want to make it into separate sections. Here at the tail section, you know, that's a no-brainer because it's already cut all the way through. And then I have this here. I can go ahead and, and pack this up and freeze this uh, side by side. I basically have three very nice chunks of fillet there that uh, are pretty much about 95% bone free. So I don't know about you, this is an option. You can certainly cook up this whole slab for uh, guests and company and just you know let them get those pin bones out of there or you can take some time and, and cut those pin bones out, give that a try. Again, it does take a lot of pressure, sharp knife, run along those rib bones, take that sliver of meat out of there and it's, uh, it's pretty doggone simple. So hopefully that gives you a little tip on something else to try when you're filleting your fish. It's an option, there's a lot of ways to fillet fish, I get it, this is something I started doing and enjoy it. Okay, with that, we're gonna jump out for a quick break. Defiance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, Defiance Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase? If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals, so we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes, and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone, or in store, and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed. Quality service from real people who know metal. We are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives, fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. 
Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal. Visit or call a metal supermarket store near you today. What if there was a smarter way to search for your new home? Introducing the Better Homes and Gardens real estate website and mobile app. This revolutionary new search tool puts your needs first. Narrow your search to what matters most to your family, like school data, school districts, and even walk scores. Get easy access to your local affiliated agent, as well as unique and local insights about neighborhoods and properties directly within the app. With sync and safe preferences, you'll always pick up wherever you left off. Get your smarter search started today with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Hey guys, welcome back here in studio just to wrap up the show. Thanks for uh, hanging out this evening. Thanks for all the online interaction as we've been chatting along here. Uh, appreciate you being around for the better part of this year as we roll into season two starting next week. Hope to have live relevant content for you next week, uh, albeit might be some phone segments and some how-tos and of course another fantastic recipe of the week, but we'll bring it all to you live right here out of the Fish on Northwest studio each and every week, Thursday evening, 7 p.m. So thanks for joining me this evening. Uh, we'll reconvene next week. Have a good week. Stay safe. Follow procedures that are put out there for everybody to adhere to. And let's get outdoors and enjoy while we can. And uh, you know what? Take care. God bless. We'll see you next week.